Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Second State Press uh, virtual studio visits. Uh, my name is Jennifer McTague, and I'm one of the co-founders at Second State Press. Um, and we're really excited to have um, you here along with um, artist Kim Altomare. And we are really excited to learn about their process, um, their studio work, um, and to just dive deeper into the printmaking process. I'm going to turn things over to um, Joanna Booth, who is our program coordinator at Second State Press, um, to get things started um, tonight for our virtual studio visit. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, yeah, and thank you, Kim, for coming today and being willing to show us a little peek into your practice. Um, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction to Kim, reading their bio. Kim Altamari is a visual artist who received their MFA from Yale School of Art and their BFA from Tyler School of Art. Working with a range of mediums, including paper making, print making, and drawing, Altamari reconstructs the body from the inside out, recombining disparate parts into holes through the most material means. He is taught at Lafayette College, where he has an inaugural recipient of the Experimental Printmaking Residency in 2019. Altamari's work has been included in group and solo exhibitions at New Release Gallery, New Boone, and the Icebox. Residencies include Atlantic Center for the Arts and Yale Summer School of Art. And um, thank you, Kim. You can uh, take it away whenever you are ready. Sure. Uh, before I start sharing my slides, I also want to thank Joanna and Second State Press for inviting me to do this visit. I haven't had uh, many other people in my studio since the summer. Um, I also, as I was gathering images, I realized that I started as a fob only a little bit over a year ago, although it has felt like a much longer span of time. Printmaking has become such an integral part of my practice, and I'm excited to share some of these prints with uh, alongside my other work. So I'm going to share my screen. And um, once I do so, I won't be really able to see you guys in Zoom. So um, if there's like any issues, like you can't hear me, then um, please let me know. So I'm aiming to talk about talk for about 30 minutes and then go into questions and conversation. The slides will be a mix of documentation and in progress photos of work from the past three to four years. Uh, it covers a little bit of grad school and the work I've been making since then. Since 30 minutes isn't really a huge stretch of time, I'm going to really focus more so on the process and making aspect. I really operate from the idea that meaning and content is generated through the work itself, whether or not the content is, is that that I initially intended. Um, but since I've been in this longer period of rethinking my work and rethinking the language I used to talk about the work, I'm going to read a small paragraph of uh, what I've been writing. It's not fully fleshed out, but I thought it would give a good context to some of the things that are on my mind in the studio. The paragraph. Um, I've been thinking about my work as a way of paying attention to sen sensory experience through a trans framework. Reading through Berlant's Cruel Optimism, I'm struck by their attention to intuition as embodied knowledge specifically cultivated to navigate the world. Turning this definition towards my work, I choose processes and mediums that feed into each other, allowing each other to generate new imagery. These processes, papermaking, printmaking, drawing, hinge on their own sense of tactility and feeling. Uh, there is the pleasure of looking, of making turned inside out and displayed outward, a public kind of intimacy. Okay, so here's the first image. It's, uh, we could, let's call this work in the slide a painting. It's from 2018, my second year into my MFA. I briefly wanted to show some of this work for a few reasons. While I was in school, I was in the midst of developing a studio practice based in material process while trying to push the conceptual interests behind the work. Um, most of the work I was making was focused on a mapping of an unconscious and bringing it out into a real and concrete space through shaped and sculptural paintings. I was interested in giving this mapping a bodily form where the painting or object became embodied and exerted a kind of presence or affect on the viewer. Uh, the surface of the work was built up through the layering of acrylic paint and uh, paper mache and the stains would evoke other material surfaces such as metal, uh, earth or skin. 
Uh, the work of Eva Hess, Elizabeth Murray, Lee Bontecu, Henry Morton were really important to me at the time. They all made work that played with the boundaries between painting and sculpture, uh, distinctions between craft and fine art, low and high source material. Um, <clears throat> the idea of the boundary or the delineation between binaries or the difference between the interior of something and its exterior was really exciting to me at the time and was drawn from my readings in psychoanalysis theory and science fiction. Um, in addition to boundaries and bodies, the paintings began to exceed the constraints of the rectangle and take on their own shape. And instead of the painting structure being the container, uh, the installational space or really the wall became the container for the work. And this uh, last image is from uh, my thesis show at school. Uh, <clears throat> after graduating from Yale, I spent the fall in 2019 at Lafayette College, a school in Easton, uh, as a visiting artist. While I did make some sculptural work there during the semester, I really want to focus on the printmaking I made during that time. Um, as part of my role there, I was going to develop a de an addition with the Experimental Print Institute, um, which is a print shop on campus that functions both as the classroom space and also as like a professional print publisher. So at this point, I'd always enjoyed printmaking and was really drawn to the tactile material aspects of it, especially with etching, but was at a place where I didn't quite know how to use or justify the multiple or really integrate it into my practice. Uh, so on my own time, I was working on these shaped copper plates uh, with hard ground, soft ground, and aqua tint, and was really playing with the printing of, of them specifically like with, with Sheen Calais and inking the plate both in relief and um, also in intaglio. So uh, when I started working on the addition with Pedro, the, who's the director and Jace the master printer, I initially thought I was gonna continue working with, with intaglio. And, but uh, I was skeptical of this at first, but Pedro suggested starting with silk screening as a place to start as he felt that my drawing language would uh, be kind of better suited for that. So we, we started with uh, the shape of one of those copper prints uh, and we turned that into a screen and I made a set of successive drawings on mylar that were made in relation to each other and to the initial shape. And um, my thought process at the time was that when printed, they would kind of weave in and out and interact with each other. <clears throat> So this didn't really happen once we started printing all of the layers together. Uh, we really tried playing with the order layer, uh, order of the layers, the transparency and the color, uh, but the image didn't really cohere. So at that point we we accumulated quite a lot of proofs. And so um, I went back in and made a few collaged variations out of all of the proofs that we could work uh, and turn back into a print. And <clears throat> cutting up and rearranging parts of these prints into a new whole or kinds of bodies really reset my mind uh, in what was possible for the visual form of the work. So with the chosen uh, collage, which was the one on the left here, uh, we turned them, we went back into the Mylar films and reassembled them. I really uh, kind of go into this process because making an addition at this point was a completely different experience than uh, printing my own work. Uh, not only are you collaborating with other people who are helping you conceive your work, I found th that the spatial uh, logic that happens in printmaking, uh, the successive layering from back to front that forms a whole, all of the color mixing that kind of happens in between to be kind of um, hard to kind of spatially imagine at that time. And like those kinds of qualities um, didn't really happen in my work uh, from, print, from painting. So as the, that print edition project was winding down, the pandemic started and it was put on hold. Uh, I ended up in Bucks County with, with my family and didn't have a studio. So while I was setting up uh, these various art making spaces in my bedroom, uh, the porch and the backyard and kind of attempted to, to uh, continue my studio practice, I actually found myself quite paralyzed and not really motivated to do things or I'm motivated to make work for the first time. So really uh, with that period of the spring, summer and fall, I kind of find um, 
they don't really kind of match up with what my memory is at that time. I really found myself kind of questioning my own practice and uh, keeping up with my studio and kind of turned to uh, other things like outside of that. So, um, but one thing I did do around this time was to set up a paper making process for myself. Uh, back in grad school, a few people suggested using Abaca paper, uh, which is a strong plant fiber that could be manipulated three dimensionally when freshly casted and shrinks and reacts when it dries. Uh, the Experimental Print Institute did have a paper beater, which I did try out, and I did take a class early on in 2020. Um, uh, took a class at Dudon in New York, but I really wanted to uh, explore paper making sculptural potential for the work and figure out if it was a process that could be adapted to a home studio. As I kept researching paper making and paper artists, I was really struck by the versatility of it as a medium. Uh, when a sheet of paper is casted, there is the opportunity to collage on all sorts of material or brush on pigmented pulp that have fully pressed uh, bonds with the paper fibers during the drying process. Uh, so not only did I kind of find that an exciting uh, idea in like a process kind of sense, but also conceptually. So I think the next few slides are, are documentations of the work I also made around the same time. So this is kind of a, a placeholder image. It's from a farm I was volunteering on. I was really interested in doing a lot of active, like a lot of different activities during that summer outside that kind of pushed me into my body. Um, so around the fall, I was transitioning and was craving narratives on how to live a trans life. I started reading a lot of trans literature theory. Uh, poetry for the first time, and not only was this uh, work immensely relatable, I realized that there was like a shared visual language uh, within these works that really resonated with me. So um, I'm going to read like a short paragraph from something I was reading around that time that I kind of keep returning to. Uh, and yet from the moment we begin to emerge from the closet, transness calls first for attention to the labor involved in producing obvious things. Transition is estrangement. By estranging, I mean that it bears the same character that the Russian formalist Viktor Shulkovsky claimed as the most vital capacity of art, to add difficulty to the seeming naturalness of things, and in doing so, prolong and make strange a perception of the everyday so that we might see it anew. Estrangement, in other words, is a critical and contextualized attention to the experience of alienation. Transitions estrangement affects everyone involved from cisgender people who are asked to consciously consider pronouns and what they signify for the first time. To trans people who are constantly negotiating how we are seen, what exactly is being seen, what connects and what separates us from any particular category of gender. Um, what does it mean to be inside of a word, both seeking and resisting the power of other people to validate your realness? So, um, this kind of uh, stewing and all of this reading material really made me want to dive back into my studio practice. And conveniently enough around that time, I did find a studio to rent. So I immediately moved in and was like ready to uh, dive back in. Um, and so in the new and empty studio, um, the print edition at this time was finally finalized and I picked up uh, my portion of the edition. So I was able to kind of spend time with it again. And I really wanted to tap into kind of that energy of making that I had during the, the planning process of the print, um, which leads us to second state. So when I initially uh, started as a fob holder, I wanted to use printmaking as an investigatory uh, medium. I started to uh, make collagraph plates where I could play around with both relief and intaglio inking. Um, I was really into this catalog about female printmakers at Atelier 17 in New York and was really excited by all of the, the experimentation that they were doing, especially with etching. And I wanted to see like how much variation I could push out of uh, an individual plate. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, some thoughts as I was gathering these images about like the Jasper John show. I know it closed a few weeks ago, but I 
uh, when I saw it, I was really impressed by like the use of printmaking and the thoroughness of the depth of the work and how he kind of like re-engages and dips out of his own uh, history of work. So I've uh, been doing a lot of reading about Jasper Jones for the first time. And I was reading this essay called The Mor Metamorphic Press and it conceptualizes the formal vocabulary of his printmaking, um, repetition, reversal, estrangement, touch, flatness, uh, things that can be in intrinsic to the printmaking process. Uh, and I, I guess I was just really struck by all of the, that vocabulary as something to kind of actively think about when making a print. So, and here's another variation of the print before. And then with the collagraphs, I started to make shaped plates and the next two are the same plate, but uh, printed uh, in a few different variations. Um, <clears throat> and then once I started making the shaped plates, I kind of wanted to jump up in scale. So uh, this one and the, I think the next two or three are either 22 by 30 or the next size up. Um, and I made a set of collagraph plates that were intended to form a continuous body uh, when rolled through the press. But uh, when I finally took these plates to the shop, I was actually ended up more interested in kind of re rearranging them um, on the paper itself. And the inking with these is way more painterly. I'm using a lot more uh, brushing on of the ink here. So I, uh, from there, I really wanted to figure out how to kind of get these textures and play into uh, other print mediums. Uh, for, uh, for etching, I use soft ground to pick up the textures from the holograph plates or I'd arrange it, uh, I, or I would arrange materials on the plate before running it through the press, something that I kind of picked up from that Atelier 17 book. And, and then these uh, etchings are uh, two plates registered to each other. And um, I'm either, flip, either printing them in different orders or flipping them uh, in the registration. So while, of, while all of that activity was happening at the, the print shop, I uh, was look, initially looking at Fleischer to see if I could take a paper making class and try to build up my knowledge there. Um, I instead took this wire weaving class, which really opened up um, all of this sculptural potential in the work. I could now create much larger armatures that seemed much more organic in shape and much more specific to the visual language I was using. Uh, previously, I was like using chicken wire or cardboard and was kind of frustrated by the limitations of those materials. So I think this is this is over the past like spring and summer, I started to kind of build up these larger armatures and uh, was thinking about how to kind of sheet cast paper over them. Um, let's see. And so with the, the abaca and the paper making process, um, the, the sheet casting is um, very similar to paper mache. And I kind of um, found that, uh, I was thinking of painting the, the surfaces entirely, but I just um, found it more interesting to kind of start collaging back onto the surfaces instead of using acrylic paint. So the next, few slides are stuff that are like really recently made in the studio <clears throat> and um, also images from the side. So you can kind of see how they're hanging on the wall. And additionally with the abacot, it can, um, when you cast it, it can be really translucent and transparent. So I became interested in it as like a 2D medium as well. Uh, with the three larger works on the bottom, I would collage uh, either paper weavings or material from prints or fabric uh, into a wet sheet and then encase it with another sheet of abaca. Um, so everything is literally embedded in the surface.
And I think this one and this are the last slides. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wow. I, you're, the breadth of your work is just so, it's really impressive. Um, and it was really nice to kind of see it all in, in sequence. Um, I think the first thing at this point, we'll like, I'll ask Kim a couple questions and then we'll kind of open it up to everyone if they have questions for Kim as well. Um, but I guess the first one that I wanted to ask you, which I know you've touched on a little bit, but I'm just really impressed by how you shift through the sculpture and uh, two dimensional, just, it seems very easy for you to go back and forth. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're able to kind of bring the 2D to, to 3D? It's been like kind of a long adaptation to, to that ability. I kind of only really started making more dimensional work in grad school. And I guess it's, it, you can kind of see from like those initial pieces, they're, they're kind of made in a way that a painter would approach sculpture. They're like canvas, literally stretched over an armature and then painted. Mm -hmm. And I have kind of just been exploring different kind of craft methodologies, like weaving is really interesting to me and how that's a kind of armature. Um, and it's th this kind of spatial thinking that I feel like has kind of or, like, came about over time mm -hmm. yeah that's it's really cool to see how you're able to shift back and forth um my other question was um i know you're like very thoughtful in like kind of the the shapes that you make um but i'm also wondering how you conceive of how color plays into those shapes and how that kind of continues some of the narratives that you um are hoping to to convey um so like the shapes of like the individual works or, or the, just like, like individual works or like your sculptures um, and just like kind of how color would add into some of the messaging that you're making. Yeah, color is an interesting question because I always find it difficult to kind of understand like what the system I'm choosing to use each time. Um, and I like also came to a realization in a studio visit recently with some of those color graph plates about my use of color. Um, like in the past, I was really interested in using like a lot of different uh, color through like staining and the overlapping and the transparency and the pigmentation kind of like build up like a history. Um, but now I'm kind of like more interested in color as like through like a drawing language, like through color or uh, like watercolor. Um, I guess like less so referential than it was before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in your earlier works, the colors that you chose were just so bright and vibrant. And then kind of in your later works, they seem to have like muted down a little bit. So I guess I was curious as to what, how that happened. Yeah, also, yeah, printmaking is great for limiting color. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, did I get to all the questions? I guess um, maybe it's my last one was um, just kind of going off of one of the statements that you sent me, one of your, the sentences that stood out to me was that um, vitality oozes out of the margins and begins to speak and kind of reference to some of your more sculptural pieces. And I guess um, wondering in kind of like a more literal way, like what are you hoping that says or like, when you know when the vitality oozes out of the margins, what is what are you hoping the audience kind of gets from that? Um, with like vitality, well, there was like a few different things I was thinking about when you sent me that question. Um, one thing is that it, that like part of the work is trying to kind of imbibe it with, with like a sense of like liveliness or gesture, and um, interested in like how objects can have a life of their own and kind of push back at you. And I guess with the margins, I'm, there was probably something like specific in the writing I was uh, referencing. But I keep thinking about this show a few years ago from 2018 uh, at the National Gallery in Washington, 
the show is called Outliers and it kind of fused together, um, you know, outsider artists with the with other like maybe more stream or more centered artists that were working alongside them. And it was trying to kind of push forward or, or kind of argue for a recentering of what we consider important in like the art historical canon. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that kind of form of this, like the inside and the outside has been something I've been like thinking about. Great, thank you. Um, at this point, I would encourage anyone to ask him questions of their own. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I necessarily have a, a question, but um, just kind of more of a comment of seeing your process um, laid out and move and um, even like the way that you were talking about how you got kind of stuck during the pandemic, but still kind of seeing this work kind of churning from it. Um, I just think that that's so inspiring and helpful to see that like, this isn't just like a constant, um, you know, churning out of like high quality, super glossy prints that there are, you know, kind of these ebbs and flows and, um, you know, pausing on that um, field photo felt, felt super important. Um, and it kind of then like seeing the work that came after that just made so much more sense. Um, I haven't seen in person um, some of these wall sculptures, these new wall sculptures. Um, I think they're just so gorgeous and you can kind of see that all the previous work like embodied into these new, um, new sculptures that you're creating. Um, uh, it's really, um, really beautiful to see so deeply inside your process. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah, thank you. Very much so agreed. It is cool to see like kind of coming out of a pandemic. And also I think it's cool that you kind of went back to the source and went to like paper, like after the pandemic, because I feel like that's like, or not after, but you know, after coming out of like intense quarantine, but like that's kind of like the source of like a lot of artistic creation. So going back to paper just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I had a question. Uh, so coming from a painting background and then kind of moving into the printmaking realm. Um, and then, yeah, like similar to Jen, I haven't seen any of those, the like wall sculptures, which are amazing. Um, and I'm curious, I've always kind of thought of the process of printmaking as more sculptural. Um, uh, but it seems like in your process, it's almost the bridge between sculpture and painting. And I was curious, uh, like in the process of printmaking, when you're cutting down plates and you're kind of building up the surface, uh, do you find that that helps to inform your larger, like more 3D sculptural works? Or has that helped your process evolve into a more sculptural realm? Or was that just kind of all, always there? If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I think it's kind of hard to answer in like a like a concrete or an intentful way. Like I think a lot of the, the printmaking I did this year has informed it. Um, although it's like something about like how printmaking forces you to make certain kinds of decisions um, that I have found really useful in kind of like cutting out like, um, let me, it just kind of cuts out a lot of different elements so you can kind of focus in on like one or two specific things like having one shape that you can ink in a million different ways and figuring out what that does I think has been like the most helpful for that. And then do you find that I guess how do I say this uh do you find that you're, do you, when you see your prints, do you think they lean more towards, more towards informing your sculptures or do you find them more leaning towards your like more painterly practice in the past? Kind of. Uh, or are they all kind of not like as separate as I'm making them out to sound? Yeah, they're, they're not really getting to be integrated 
like everything I try to hang everything together in the studio Mm. um and I've kind of been excited by that because I feel like the painting it gets I was so focused on like the one painting and then you do the next painting and kind of like I just I don't know really appreciate doing many different things at once instead of just one single thing I guess I have, I'll ask one more question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you ever, do you, have you ever put any thought to like additioning your sculptures? Um, I mean, with paper, there is like the element or the possibility of like replication. I haven't done much casting yet um, with like a mold, although I am very interested. That's something I'm, I'm still thinking about. Yeah, I definitely have been thinking about smaller works that are um, kind of meant to be in, in multiple. Cool. Okay. I guess piggybacking off of that a little bit, um, some of the newer sculpture work, um, especially they felt um, like cleaner vessels um, than say some of the earlier works that definitely were just so like, um, just had so much more, they almost felt more like, um, just so much more sculptural and these felt like more like sculpture vessels. Um, have you have you thought about uh, clay work in, into some of this? Oh, I'm, I'm taking a class. I'm You're taking a class, class next yeah. time when the clay studio opens up again. That's, that's super awesome. I could see some of that. And especially the way that you're like applying mark onto them seems like there's a lot of languages and cl- um, glaze uh, that I feel like would have this really, I'd just be so interested to see how you would, you would respond to that. Yeah, I'm really excited to do that. It's a hand building class. Oh, so good. Yeah. You can also screen print onto clay, just saying. Oh, I definitely want to learn how to do that. (laughs) I had no idea you could do that. That sounds so cool. I know I'm already trying to convince the clay studio to do a collaborative class with us. Oh yeah, right across the street. That, that definitely has to happen. That's awesome. Um, I guess I'll open up one more time. If anyone else has any more questions for Kim? Yeah. Um. I. Okay. I think I saw the show of women printmakers from Atelier Seventeen in. I haven't read the catalog, but I saw the show, I think. What else are you like looking at these days or reading? Um, what's informing your work? Like not informing it, but what are you, what are you reading? What's fun? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I like have been looking through that Jasper Johns catalog from the big show at the PMA and the Whitney. Um, Let's see, I kind of have like a a two person book club with another friend and we've been reading like Black on Both Sides, um, which kind of like explores like the history of like uh, transgender and blackness. And I'm trying to think of like fiction I've been reading, um, like Jeanette, like uh, Jean Genet too. Great. Thank you. I don't know if you wanted to follow up, Sophie, but no. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I will, I can wrap this up a little bit early. Um, thank you again, Kim, so much thank for you. sharing your work with us. It's been really inspiring to see the trajectory of your, of your art. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I love those in-process shots. They were great. <laughs> yeah, I love the in-process. Yeah. Yeah, that's, we need more of those. So thanks for sharing that too. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, at this point, I'll stay on for a little bit while longer, but thank you everyone for coming and uh, for another edition of the Virtual Studio Visits. We'll be having another one in March. So come back again and um, yeah, happy printing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim and Joanna. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So beautiful. Thank you. Mom.
Can... <laughs> wow, right on schedule. <laughs> yes, right on cue. Yep. Did you stop the recording? Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs>